Tonight, Ontario's top doctor hints at when mask mandates could end. If the trends continue, removing uh, mandatory masking uh, by the end of March. They've been a part of our lives for two years now, but Dr. Kieran Moore saying today mask mandates could be lifting in a few weeks thanks to promising trends. Plus... The place ended up selling for 300000 over asking. The price of buying a home in Toronto continues to skyrocket even as sales slow. And... Russian forces attack Europe's largest nuclear plant in Ukraine as fighting intensifies across the country. More than a million people have now fled with many more desperate to leave. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We begin with breaking news. CBC News has learned that Deputy Premier Christine Elliott is poised to announce she's leaving politics. Multiple sources say Elliott will announce tomorrow she is stepping down from her cabinet post and will not run in the June 2nd election. Now, Elliott has served as health minister since Doug Ford took office in 2018 and has been at the forefront of the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Reached tonight, officials representing Ford and Elliott would neither confirm nor deny she's resigning. Elliot has been an MPP for 13 years. She represents the riding of Newmarket Aurora. Her resignation means the PCs will need to nominate a candidate to run in her place. Now, this marks the second senior member of Doug Ford's cabinet to step down this year. Rod Phillips announced his resignation as Minister of Long-Term Care back in January. Well, they've become a normal part of our lives for two years now. Well, today, Ontario's top doctor said mandatory masking could be dropped at the end of this month. But not all experts are convinced it's the way to go. At least not yet. Our Jessica Ng has more. We can anticipate uh, uh, if the trends continue, removing uh, mas mandatory masking uh, by the end of March. Days after vaccine requirements were dropped at many indoor settings, Dr. Kieran Moore says it could be just a few weeks until the same happens for mask mandates. I do believe the highest risk is behind us. We saw the risk of hospitalization peak at around the third week of January. The province is also using other methods to track COVID levels given limited testing. We are paying close attention to our wastewater surveillance. We're going to go towards the ventilator up and over. It's shown officials how a newer Omicron subvariant named BA2 is gaining traction. While BA2 is very similar to BA1 uh, Omicron subvariant that is currently dominant in Ontario, we know that it is 30% more transmissible predicting it will become the dominant strain in the province in a matter of weeks. Still, the trends look so good. His reassurance is not enough for Dr. Anna Banerjee. We still have fairly high numbers. Does it make me a bit nervous? Yeah, it does. She says we should pump the brakes on removing mask mandates, at least for now, especially in schools, hospitals and other congregate settings. They need to look at it very carefully. It makes sense to have masks uh, for a while until we really know that the numbers are going down. She adds not all parts of the province are in the same boat. The Northern Ontario is really on fire. When we have this pan Ontario approach, we have to remember that there are vulnerable populations that we really need to watch out for. She goes back to data and how we don't truly know the scope of Omicron's reach in Ontario, let alone a subvariant. In general, the numbers are coming down, but yeah, it feels like we're flying in the dark. Even if they're changing policy, it doesn't mean that COVID's not here. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. As expected, the price of gas across the GTA soaring today. Prices rose sharply overnight and are poised to leap again. Our Del Manukduk takes a look. The price of gas hit a record high in Ontario today, putting the squeeze on drivers. That's if they can find any at all. There's no gas. I will go to another gas station now. I waste my time. I go to another one. They don't have. They don't have. Some stations have run out of fuel, and prices are set to jump again tomorrow by another seven cents, hitting about $1.75 per litre at some stations. The increases are prompting some motorists to consider switching to electric vehicles if they haven't already. 68 bucks. <laughs> and I'm just really glad my husband got his electric car, yes, two days ago. So glad to be getting off gas. Electric cars, 
It's kind of appealing, but on the other hand, they come with a host of other issues. Diesel prices are also rising, which affects farmers, trains, planes, and trucks transporting goods. No As for what that could mean for consumers... Other than gas retailers, other retailers should probably respond a little bit slower. And again, typically, it's not that large of an impact. Right? Ofer Barron with the Rotman School of Business says it's more likely consumers will see an impact on home deliveries. Obviously, there are tens of packages on the truck, but still, there's uh, the ratio of gas to gas cost to item is uh, probably larger with e-commerce. As for farmers, they're eating the cost because market prices for their goods are often contracted ahead. I can't say, oh, wait a minute, I've just had to absorb another 10 cents a pound on my beef for feed, for transport, so I'm going to add that 10 cents a pound at the market. I can't do that. The market will just say, I'm sorry, Crispin, you're going to take what you're getting, period. Diesel fuel is expected to jump 16 cents tomorrow. Regular gas could hit $1.77 by the weekend. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. And meanwhile, the price of buying a home in Toronto also continues to skyrocket. The Toronto Real Estate Board just released numbers for February. And while sales are down, it's not from a lack of demand. Our Greg Ross reports. We'd like a detached uh, brick bungalow, um, potentially a two-car garage, kitchen living, and one bedroom. For the better part of the past year, Patricia Coelho and her husband have been looking to move out of their 580-square-foot condo in Etobicoke and into a house. She says the search only intensified with the birth of their daughter. We don't have a lot of time. She's getting bigger. She's only six weeks now, but sooner or later she'll be walking, crawling. Coelho says they have a budget of about $1.2 million, but it keeps falling short every time they bid for a home. In November, we placed a bid on a home. There's 28 other offers, and we already went over almost $200,000 over asking, and uh, this, the place ended up selling for $300,000 over asking. According to the Toronto Real Estate Board, the average cost of buying any home in Toronto last month was just over $1.2 million, up from about $995,000 a year. Year ago. To get a detached home like Coelho was looking for, the average price is up 23% from last year to over $2 million. Even though uh, sales were off a little bit in comparison to last year, there's still very strong competition between buyers. Jason Mercer with Treb says supply and demand is the biggest issue facing the Toronto market. The population has continued to grow, the economy has continued to grow, and so the demand for ownership housing has, has trended upwards. We haven't seen the construction of new homes keeping up with population growth. Mercer says this also has an impact on listings of older homes. People aren't listing their home for sale because they, they fear that they won't be able to find another home that meets their needs. Coelho says they're going to have to consider other options. We're starting to struggle a little bit. We're thinking that we might need to up our budget. And potentially lowering their expectations. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, another very cool day. The sunshine was nice, though. Yeah, the sun absolutely helps, but it was one of those things where the temperature was cooling, continuing to cool, so that really, because we were moving into a changing pattern, we hit our daytime high, essentially at midnight. Our temperature was still at minus three in Toronto, minus seven in Barrie, and minus one for Windsor. And then as we move towards the morning hours, and at this time of year, it is around 7 a.m. or so that we tend to hit those lows. Uh, we hit that forecast low of minus 10. Barry was down to minus 15. And, you know, tonight, if anything, we'll see the temperatures being just a little bit cooler. Uh, there's a look. Essentially, your daytime highs, although Kitchener, you were actually at minus 6. Um, look at what's going on here with the clear conditions. So high pressure, this does allow the temperatures to fall down overnight. But it means in most cases we'll have sun again tomorrow. Things will start to change on Saturday. This could be a problem, that freezing rain risk into eastern Ontario. I'm going to talk more about that coming up. And the warm-up we're going to have, but overnight tonight, minus 12, and then tomorrow up to 1 degree, Calva. Thanks so much, Colette. And we are tracking a dramatic development in Ukraine tonight, where Russian forces reportedly attacked Europe's largest nuclear power plant, and a fire broke out. Now, this is a look at the power station located.
located in the southern city of Inohodar. Thankfully, officials say the radiation risk has been secured and that the incident happened at a building on the perimeter of the plant, not an active reactor. The United Nations Refugee Agency says more than one million people have now fled the fighting in Ukraine. They continue to pour into neighboring countries as Russian forces intensify their assaults on a number of cities. Russia's military is now laying siege to Mariupol. The southern port city has been the scene of fighting for the past several days. It is now reported to be without communications, electricity and water. The Russians claim to have taken Kherson, another black seaport. Now, another southern city in Nohodar, as you just saw earlier, has also become the focus of fighting, home to the largest nuclear reactor in Europe and supplies about a quarter of Ukraine's electricity. Fighting also continues around the capital, Kiev and Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. There was a second day of ceasefire talks on Thursday. The Ukrainian officials say there will be a third. And the Canadian government continues to expand its response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Today, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland announced a blanket 35 percent tariff on all goods coming into Canada from Russia and its ally, Belarus. And Immigration Minister Sean Fraser announced Ottawa is going to make it easier for Ukrainians who want to come to Canada. For those who need a safe haven while the war ravages their homeland, we are creating the Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel. We are also introducing an expedited path to permanent residency for Ukrainians seeking to reunite with family members who are already in Canada through a new family sponsorship pro program. Defence Minister Anita Anand announced further military aid to Ukraine. Canada will send up to 4,500 rocket launchers and 7,500 hand grenades. Ottawa is also giving Ukraine $1 million toward the purchase of high-resolution satellite imagery to help monitor the movement of Russian forces. And we've been telling you about people in the GTA organizing to help those in the war zone. Well, some have family in Ukraine. Others say they just want to help. Ali Shiasan is speaking with two long-lost cousins on different sides of the world, doing what they can to lend a hand. As the invasion of Ukraine continues, Anna Ganeim watches in worry. She has family in Lviv. Actually, my cousin and I hadn't really even... Um, been that close or gone to talk to each other up until this point um you know mostly because we were growing up in two separate countries and i haven't seen her since i was i was six years old she felt compelled to reach out to her cousin yevhenia then i heard from my mom that she's doing this daily that my cousin is volunteering on the ground so i was like all right well give me her number let me call her and then we started strategizing together Yevhenia meets with volunteers at one of the aid outposts and gets a list of supplies. These are the things we need, go and find them. They drive out to warehouses, stores, uh, bazaars, and then she buys whatever she can. Things like extra power cords and generators, headlamps, medical supplies, long underwear. She'll even make them food to bring back to the outpost. Anna helps by sending her money from her own account, but also through donations from friends and through a GoFundMe page. For some people, it might be like, there's seven now who donated. Like, I look at every single one of those and I'm like, oh my gosh, someone gave $30. Yeah. And like that $30 will cover so much and that's the point, right? Anna has also connected with a local freight company taking donations of medical supplies to Ukraine. A friend of a friend who also has family in Ukraine has brought over some things for us to drop off. I wanted to ask Yevhenia what it means to have her cousin's help. We reached her while she sheltered underground for the night. She's my support. She's my power. She's my protection. Sorry. Okay, I'm crying too. Mm -hmm. If you cry, I cry. <laughs> None of this could have been possible without people showing up for me because I'm showing up for her. And that's that chain of humanity that we lead all the way to places we're unfamiliar with, to family members we haven't talked to, and to causes we may not really understand, but that doesn't mean we can't show up. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. The provincial government today announced $1 million in funding towards a new mental health centre for first responders and medical personnel. The centre will provide access to a range of services for post-traumatic stress treatment. Natalie Collada has more. 
Toronto ER registered nurse Aram Chagala knows the mental toll of life on the front lines of the pandemic. News today of a treatment centre for first responders suffering from post-traumatic stress injury, she says, is long overdue. You don't know what people go through. Um, sometimes we don't understand what our other colleagues are going through and you don't really understand the darkness that someone has inside themselves and what they're feeling. Today, the province announced both it and the federal government are each providing a million dollars towards the creation of the Renamede First Responders Post Traumatic Stress Injury Center. First responders are two times more likely than the average person to develop PTSI on the job. According to the province, it's estimated that over 13,000 first responders are suffering. That number projected to rise to over 16,000 by 2040. Likely, then, then the need will outstrip the, the capacity. How many of your members are suffering from PTSD right now? I would expect all of us. How about that for an answer? I couldn't uh, bear the suffering of my colleagues, especially uh, during the period uh, of the first and second wave in long-term care and what they were telling me that they were seeing. Consider this. According to Toronto's fire chief, 107 officers are currently off on stress-related injuries, up from just over 80 in mid-December. It's known as Station 3434. It, along with a facility in Peel, will provide a range of services, from prevention to intensive treatment with 40 inpatient beds. I, of course, reflect right back to... Would this have helped my brother? Dilnaz Garda lost her brother, a Toronto police officer, to suicide five years ago. She's since founded an organization that offers support to police officers and their families. Something that is understanding of first responder culture, sensitive to that, welcoming of them, uh, you know, with their own struggles and experiences, it's incredibly important. So is, she says, immediate access to help. Construction is expected to begin this spring. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario's Green Party is launching a dedicated mental health platform, something they say is the first for an Ontario political party. Mental health is health. It must be a priority. And that's why we're committed to increasing mental health and addiction spending to 10% of the health budget. Schreiner says that figure was chosen because experts estimate that 10% of the burden of care in the health system is for mental health. The party says it wants to make it easier for Ontarians to access mental health care. The Greens would also boost the range of mental health services covered by OHIP. Schreiner says to help pay for the plan, he would reverse the Ford government's decision to eliminate license plate sticker renewal fees. Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca is promising to give money back to families with children in daycare if his party forms government in the June provincial election. Not only will we as a priority get a good deal done with the federal government, we will make relief retroactive back to January 1st for Oakville's families and for Ontario families. We will give people 50% retroactively off the cost of their childcare. Del Duca says families will receive a rebate averaging more than $2,700 per child for daycare costs. The Liberal leader didn't say how much the plan will cost the province. He says the party will release those details in the coming weeks in its campaign platform. Ontario is the only province that has yet to reach an agreement with the federal government on $10 a day childcare. And you're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. Clear tonight, staying that way overnight. Currently, it is minus 7 in the city, and we will be waking up to the same cold air in the morning. Let's go back to Colette now. And Colette, I wish we could skip over the next couple of days and go straight to Sunday. Yeah, it's going to be so nice, Kelda, to have those temperatures spike to places we haven't seen or felt in a while. It does come with some rainfall, but I know we'll all kind of take that as the trade-off. So another cold one tonight and a cold start tomorrow, but then the temperatures for the daytime high get closer to seasonal. That rain is going to move in late Saturday and into Sunday, and that's also when we're going to see with that warm front, that push of much milder air getting our daytime high into the teens. 
All right, let's go ahead and show you what's happening here. So high pressure essentially gives us the quiet conditions and clear skies tonight. Now, things start to change, especially later in the day Friday, but you'll start to feel that increase in cloudiness into southwestern Ontario. We do become mostly overcast into Saturday, but watching that warm front as it's pushing through the province could be a little bit of freezing drizzle even into cottage country or kind of towards the eastern part of the GTA or north. But it's really as you get over towards Smith Falls, the nation's capital, Kingston, Westport, through those regions, that there's more of a risk of getting into some freezing rain Saturday night. So Saturday night into Sunday morning as that front passes. So there is a special weather statement for these areas from Environment Canada, just giving you the heads up, okay? So it's still a little ways away, but just so you can be kind of planning for that. Overnight temperatures, here we go. It was minus 7 last night, winds are tonight, minus 11, feeling like minus 16. The winds are actually a little lighter than they were last night, so the wind chills are almost comparable. And similar, still going to be a pretty chilly wind chill here, even though the winds are 10, 15 kilometers an hour, down to minus 12 for Toronto, Markham, you guys, into minus 15 territory. And there you go, tomorrow, 1 degree, certainly warmer than today, and much warmer as we get into Saturday. And then that huge push comes. Now, it will be breezy as well so not just wet and mild but some windy conditions in here on the back side of this cold air comes right back and we may even get into some measurable snow as we go into monday kelda all right thanks so much colette before we go today peel's top doctor received a special honor for his work during the pandemic this is a key to the city of mississauga and since becoming mayor in 2014, I have only given out a handful of these. Receiving a key is a sign of great achievement and distinction. What, what we accomplished was, uh, was not mine alone. Um, I think it, it took uh, a tremendous team and, and this, this honour really represents, I think, the work of, of many hands. Bonnie Crombie says Dr. Lowe has shown a great dedication to his work and Mississauga residents are grateful he's kept them safe during the pandemic. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.